and welcome to Widener Commonwealth Law School. Tonight's presentation, Unmasking Human Trafficking, is sponsored by Widener's Law and Government Institute. The Institute focuses on the study of governmental law and how students explore the government and how it works with the process of law. On behalf of the Institute, the law school, and our presenters, we wanna thank you each for being here tonight. There will be a question and answer session at the end. For the Zoom participants, please submit your questions in the chat box. Because this topic is and can be in depth, for the sake of time, I will begin with a brief introduction of our first speaker, Stephen Turner. If you would like more information about each of our presenters tonight, please refer to their bio information on the Eventbrite page. Stephen Turner is an anti-human trafficking consultant, trainer, and advocate who retired from the Pennsylvania Governor's Office of General Counsel in 2015. From February 2016 to December of 2017, Steve worked as a crisis advocate coordinator and training specialist for the YWCA of Harrisburg in its violence intervention and prevention program, which focuses on assisting victims and survivors of human trafficking, sex assault, and domestic violence. Steve earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Redlands and his Juris Doctor from Temple University School of Law. Steve, thank you for being here this evening. And now I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for good afternoon. Thank you so much. My name is Steve Hurd. And we had public number one. Um, we we're going to cover an impossible amount of material. We're going to leave a bunch of things behind. I mean, it is simply impossible to cover all we need to and want to cover in two hours. Each one of us here, and there's amazing subject matter experts up here, each one of us can go one to two hours without, without a script and just, and just go. So we are necessarily and apologetically going to leave a bunch of information behind. Let me introduce real quickly. And again, there's bio information because our time is short. Heather Castellino, Senior Deputy Attorney General in the Organized Crime Unit of the State AG's office. She does OC, Organized Crime Cases and Trafficking Cases. Nicole Basil. Nicole is the lead forensic nurse for UPMC Pinnacle. She leads a team of forensic nurses for seven hospitals in the UPMC Pinnacle system in South Central Pennsylvania. And among the things that Nicole does is she and her team are responsible for conducting and performing rape kits. So trafficking victims are square in the middle of that. Carrie Dwyer. Carrie is an intelligence analyst with Pennsylvania State Police, and she supports organized crime investigations uh, and anti-trafficking work. Jesse Williams, Pennsylvania State Trooper. So this is a human being who goes out every day and protects people. So it's for real. But what we have here, we have an amazing amount of expertise uh, and, and I'm just so excited. But what it means is, like I said, we're gonna have to keep moving. Um, so trigger warning, what, the subject matter, human trafficking, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault, commercial serial rape. If anyone in this room at any point I mean, th this, is, this is as disturbing and violent as you're going to see. So if anybody needs to, and, and it, it triggers anything, please, please, please take care of yourself first. I'm going to stay afterwards as well to not only answer any other questions, but also to process whatever, because we don't want anyone, anyone left behind. Um, and same thing on, on so many folks that are getting this on Zoom, please walk away from your laptop or your phone if this is, if this is too much, because this, there's no Disney or Nickelodeon version of human trafficking. What's going to happen is Heather, because this is a two hour ethics CLA, we are going to, Heather and I are going to jam into, and my timekeeper here at, at 424, you're going to shoot up a flare. Um, we're gonna put a bunch of law and rules of professional conduct here, and then we're gonna move on. And here's what we're gonna do. 
because we've got, we're going to cover trafficking 101, 202. Every single thing we're going to cover is a violation of the criminal laws of the Commonwealth. So, you know, we're not going to stop and do such such citations at the end of each slide. That's not happening. So what is sex trafficking? It is commercial serial rape. We're going to do a story of, of a young woman that, that actually Nicole and I met and two state troopers were involved with. Chloe, that's not her real name. Chloe reported being raped 15 to 20 times a day while she was in. Trapped by traffickers. Okay, so the ethics part of this, I mean, this, in order to, to do, to work with trafficking survivors, and survivors actually of intimate partner violence. I mean, this is, it's a different level of competency because there's so much trauma. This is a story of trauma. And what you're going to hear throughout this is trauma, trauma, trauma. And what happens to human beings who are exposed to horrific trauma. So, you know, to do this, you got to take a dive, a deep dive into trauma, confidentiality of information. And, you know, we all know that we, we have to hold things confidential unless, unless, especially to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm to protect a client. And that leads to this, the client with diminished capacity. One of the things that happens, again, Chloe. Chloe went through over a thousand rapes in 10 weeks. She was strangled. She was beaten. And so that necessarily affects her capacity. She had TBI, traumatic brain injury. Uh, I mean, she, she had so much. And so we have a job as lawyers working with clients that have diminished capacity. It is a heightened, it's a heightened responsibility to think beyond just, I'm sitting here in a, you know, a car accident case, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to somebody who actually may have been injured and may actually have some trauma related to the accident or whatever. I mean, this is a heightened level. There is so much PTSD running through this. And so that diminished mental capacity through traumatic brain injury, through strangulation, through the substance abuse addictions that often they are, they're, they're wrestling with as well, through repeated instances of horrific violence or horrific mistreatment, that affects your ability to process information. It affects your ability to make decisions. It affects your ability to relate, to remember. And so that's something that, that Nicole and Jesse and I see Heather deals with if there's a witness that she's got to prepare to put on the stand in a case because People process information differently. And when you have been beaten or strangled or traumatized in such a profound way, your capacity for linear thought, memory, processing information, emotional status, I mean, this is a different ball game. Um, advisor, you know, 2.1 may be the most left behind rule of professional responsibility, professional conduct. But I, this is so important because in this upside down world of trafficking, whether it's sex or labor trafficking, and we're gonna cover labor a bit too. I mean, the, again, the problem is we could do two hours just on labor, but the upside down world of this, that we, we have to also look beyond, you know, the four corners of what might look like it's in front of us moral, economic, social, political factors, and draw on resources that we may need to help represent and care for clients that are navigating unbelievable trauma. All right, I am now going to turn it over to Heather. And hold on here, let me see if I can, you know, this folks is Steve Turner's Nightmare, except, oh, how about this? And now, substantive trafficking law. Better than what I could have done. Don't say. So, 
All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Steve said, I'm a prosecutor with the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. I work in our organized crime section and um, during the course of my work there, I started to do work on human trafficking cases. So that's included in, in what I do uh, normally during um, the course of my uh, days for probably the last 10 years or so. I'm gonna do, because we are limited in time, um, a, an overview, a quick overview of um, the laws in Pennsylvania, which uh, are not exactly the same, but similar to the federal laws. Okay, so at the beginning of most of the uh, human trafficking laws in Pennsylvania are found in chapter 30. And the beginning of chapter 30 talks about um, the three P's as we refer to them, um, prosecution of human trafficking, um, protection of victims and prevention of human trafficking. These are the two main uh, statutes and sections that we use to prosecute human trafficking cases. And when I say human trafficking, that encompasses both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Uh, the first is found at 3011, which is entitled Trafficking in Individuals, and the second is 3012, uh, which is entitled Involuntary Servitude. I pulled a couple definitions from 3001 uh, from that same chapter that I think are, are helpful. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I'll, I'll just point them out. There is a definition of human trafficking. There's one for labor servitude, one for sexual servitude. A minor under this chapter is considered anyone under 18. And there is a definition of serious harm. So this first statute, which is entitled Trafficking in Individuals, lays out um, two separate ways an individual could be um, guilty or charged with trafficking. And again, trafficking is labor or sex trafficking, and it is a felony of the first degree. I'm gonna skip ahead to 3012 because it actually spells out the means by which someone can be subjected to involuntary servitude. And again, that's sex or labor. And there's 13 separate ways someone can be subjected to involuntary servitude um, that are delineated in 3012 in Pennsylvania. And at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, when they first look at this, it's somewhat overwhelming with 13 separate ways, but there's, there's reasoning and thought behind each of them. I broke them down into categories. So the first three we have up here, uh, I have in, they're not defined this way in the statute, but I put in the category of force. So you often hear of human trafficking uh, legally and, and generally, as using force, fraud, or coercion. That is not exactly the way the statute reads. In Pennsylvania, it's actually much more specific. But to put it in that framework, the first three uh, subsections I have up there, I have under force. So causing or threatening to cause serious harm to any individual, and the serious harm definition um, is in the definition sections physically restraining or threatening to physically restrain another individual and kidnapping or attempting to kidnap an individual. Those are all, I think, very straightforward. Subsections I broke down into a fraud category are uh, a little bit more uh, tricky, I think. Um, some are not explicitly defined in the law. Uh, so the fourth way or the fourth means um, would be abusing or threatening to abuse the legal process, taking or retaining the individual's personal property or real property as a means of coercion, um, engaging in unlawful conduct with respect to documents, 
extortion or fraud. Um, quick examples of those are literally a trafficker taking um, a victim or survivor's driver's license, um, passport, uh, any, anything, any of their, their phone, anything that would prevent them, the victim or survivor, from feeling as though they could leave. Uh, abusing or threatening to abuse the legal process, a quick example of that would be a trafficker finds out that the victim or survivor is uh, in prison uh, on uh, charges and awaiting trial or awaiting to hear their case. Um, they have bail set. The trafficker shows up, posts the victim's bail. The victim then owes the trafficker whatever the trafficker posted. And the trafficker uses that as a means of coercion or, or fraud to hold over the victim's head. Coercion, um, so that's the last one, two, three, four, five um, sections of that statute. Criminal coercion is actually defined in section 2006. Um, subsection 10 there is duress through the use of threat to use force against a person or other. That coercion, facilitating or controlling an individual's access to a controlled substance. So subsection 12, I wanna highlight because it's something that we see collectively, I, I think I speak for the panel, we see very, very frequently in Pennsylvania. And that means just what it says, that the trafficker either introduces the victim to using a controlled substance, takes advantage of the fact that the victim uses a controlled substance um, or knows that the victim uses a controlled substance and gradually increases um, the type of drug and the amount of drug, creating a significant debt and reliance of the survivor or victim on the trafficker. Um, I think we, we, most of us know now um, or not through personal knowledge of someone we know, but at least through things we've seen and heard on TV or online of what it's like for individuals to go through withdrawal, what it's like to be dope sick. And the traffickers use that to control and manipulate the victims. Subsection 13. Using any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause the individual to believe that if the individual does not perform the labor, services, acts, or performances, that the individual or another individual will suffer serious harm or physical restraint. So that's a mouthful. I think if you break that down, you can see that that particular subsection um, focuses, they, all these subsections focus on the trauma that Steve mentioned, but I think this one focuses um, probably the most on, on trauma because when you read into that, using any scheme plan or pattern, intending to cause an indiv individual to believe. So, you have to get into the mind of the trafficker and the victim or survivor at that point and consider another thing that Steve talked about is vulnerabilities. You have to consider that particular victim or survivor's vulnerabilities. And I think you'll hear a lot more about that from um, Jesse and Carrie, but that's, these are the subsections or the means to keep in mind when you hear more about um, the specifics of um, different cases and different things that you'll hear in the next hour and a half or so. This is a separate subsection, which is 3013, entitled Patronizing a Victim of Sexual Servitude. And you can see I put the date at the bottom of that slide because it's one of the newer subsections. Um, and this is 
either a felony of the first or third degree, which is a very serious offense in, in Pennsylvania. And this defines what most people think of as just a commercial sex buyer or a John. So this makes it a crime if someone either knowingly or with reckless disregard engages in commercial sex with an individual who is being trafficked. This is the protection part of the law in Pennsylvania. And this speaks to the evidence of a victim's past sexual conduct. As you might imagine, in a sex trafficking case, oftentimes the victims or survivors, I use the term victim because under the statute and under the law, they're defined as victims. Um, however, that's not to in any way take away from the fact that they, they are survivors. This particular section gives protection, and this is even newer than the last section, this is from June of 2021, gives specific protection to victims in sex trafficking cases. And it says that the rape shield law applies to victims in sex trafficking cases. So prior to June of 2021, we had to argue that the rape shield law should apply in sex trafficking cases. Now the legislature has amended the, the law and the statute to reflect that it specifically does apply. Another way the statute allows or provides for protection of victims of human trafficking uh, specifically says that disclosure of the name of a victim of human tra trafficking, um, it addresses that and says it should not be disclosed unless it's court authorized. So what does that mean on a day-to-day -day basis for us um, as law enforcement and prosecutors? It means anything that's filed publicly will not contain the name of a victim or a survivor. Yes, am I, am I up? Two minutes, okay. Um, Folks, this is the worst part of this job. <laughs> like the, the... No, that's, that's totally fine. Um, I'm just gonna touch on this and say, if you're interested, take a look. Um, there's also a provision for um, vacature, which would allow victims or survivors to petition the court or make a motion um, to have their prior convictions vacated uh, if they can show that they were related to being a victim of trafficking. I think I'll, that was actually my last slide, so I'll leave it there. Perfect, thank you. Let me see. Hmm. Brian. This, and I was the cry of somebody electronically frightened. I'm trying to get the video. video oh, okay. Yes, sir. Thank God. Brian. I show up at the hotel door. Okay, this is Chloe's story. Uh, I'm gonna set this up. This, this is a video that takes about eight minutes and 45 seconds. Um, this, is, this is a real story. Chloe's not her name. Uh, and, and her story, that's, 
I met Nicole in a trauma bay at Harrisburg Hospital with Chloe. We didn't know each other. Two state troopers under or plain clothes in the major crime squad, uh, Corporal Sean Pugh and former Lieutenant Lynette Quinn, who became Captain Lynette Quinn, who has since retired. They responded to a 911 call. They brought Chloe in to the, to the emergency department. And this is an 18 year old kid that went through unbelievable stuff. I'm gonna play this video and then I'm gonna clean it up afterwards or explain some more stuff. But this, this is just one of tens and tens and tens of millions of trafficking victims worldwide. I mean, there's trafficking victims a mile away from here that we don't know where they are yet. And we're working to try and find them on the, on the other side of the planet. But this is a local central PA story. And what I think some of the power is that you have law enforcement, you have medical services, you have victim services. None of us knew each other. Well, the two troopers knew each other, but we all converge and work with this young woman. I show up at the hotel door. Again, my friend brought me there, my friend I'd known since like 12 years old. She had texted me all excited. 10 weeks before I meet Chloe in the emergency department in a trauma bay, her friend had texted her two week free party, just get yourself here. And the door opens and in the back of the room, her friend is standing. I see my friend standing there. And then two men's arms come out of nowhere and grab me. They beat her and they both rape her. These two pimps rape her and say, we own you now. I had literally no clue where I was most of the time, just hotel rooms, houses, motels, cars, vans. And my friend was just there the whole time. They'd make me see 15 to 20 men every day. Rape, they'd rape me. At least three states, she was being fed drugs, whatever was available to keep her both numb and wired, as crazy as that is. And the friend said, Chloe's fast. So every morning they would hurt me so I couldn't walk right, so I couldn't run. The nine years that I've been a forensic nurse, these traffickers, these abusers, they want to physically and mentally hurt their victim. Um, she was athletic, she was a fast runner, um, hurting her to kind of control her and limit her speed to escape. Sometimes I'd recognize landmarks, famous spots, stadiums, logos, stuff like that. After 10 weeks, countless men, a decision was made to move her north. So the friend was given a car, cash. It was implied a gun. They tell me if I try to run, they'll kill me and my whole family. And they would. Chloe from central Pennsylvania recognizes 81. We've been driving for a long time and she has to stop for supplies. So the friend pulls into the convenience store gas and go. She says to Chloe, you move, you're dead, stay put. She gets out, pays for gas, gas is up. The friend says, I want cigarettes. Chloe realizes that there's gotta be a hundred cameras from every angle focusing on this gas station. Chloe pops the door 
And as the friend then is getting back in the car, Chloe runs out. I don't look back. I'm hurt. I just go as fast as I can. Into the lobby, scream and bloody murder. My friends take off, but not before mouthing, you're dead. And that is the last thing that I remember. I smell clean sheets, hand sanitizer. I walked into the, the hospital room. She was kind of rolled up in a ball. Um, I said, you know, my name's Nicole. I'm, you know, the forensic nurse examiner. To, they called to come and talk to you. And I walk in and I said who I was, Steve, and I'm from the YWC of Greater Harrisburg. And, and I'm looking at her, you know, balled up, just shaking, hyperventilating, scared, wondering. And I'm looking at her level. I said, look, you're safe. We're gonna help you. Nobody's gonna get you. And she kept saying, they're gonna get me, they're gonna find me. And I said, these troopers, nobody's getting through them. Steve was there, sort of like some kind of an angel. He tells me the nurse wants to do a rape kit. She was like, does it even, like, does it even matter? Like there's, there was many men. And I'm like, well, maybe there is a chance to get that DNA sample for either the trafficker or for one of the um, men that paid for her. They get my family safe, and Steve tells me there's a place I can go. They told me I had a bed, a room, food, a shower. You know, the YWCA is always open. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're here to provide a more just community for everyone. And individuals like Chloe, whatever that justice looks like for her is what matters to us. So we leave the emergency department, it's 2 a.m. And we come here to the YWC of Greater Harrisburg, to our shelter. And they buzz us in, you know, and we have the bed and we have the bed pack and they have underwear and pants and a shirt and socks and shoes. And they took her upstairs. And what she told me the next day was that was the first time she had actually slept in 10 weeks. We were talking about drug rehab, jobs, housing, I mean, all the things we can do for all the things that we do for free. And I was really excited. And 36 hours later, she walked out the door. And this is, this is really hard for any of us to, to comprehend, but unfortunately, Chloe went back into to trafficking. Somebody going through multiple sexual assaults, rapes, multiple times a day, days and days to months to years, continuing that abuse. I, I couldn't even imagine it's hard for any of us who don't see this every day to know the type of trauma or you know how that really works in somebody's mind. The trauma bonding, the drug addiction, the fear, the normalization of hyperviolence, it will often claw somebody back to the street. Over the years, we did find out that Chloe told a lot of people. Since we've served Chloe, we have other victims who have come to us and said that they were told. When she was with all these different girls in all these different locations, she would say, when you want out, come to the YWCA of Greater Harrisburg. They treat you different there. They understand.
This is vicarious trauma. This is Let me know 445, please. This is as real as it gets. This is one kid out of tens and tens and tens of millions. She escaped with her life out of sheets. Every morning, her friend, her friend, I'm going to use this term once and then I'm going to shorten it. There's a term called bottom bitch. I'm going to use bottom. Street. I didn't make it up. Street. That is a woman who usually a trafficking victim herself who has worked her way up in a hierarchy to do recruitment, enforcement, dispatch. Chloe grew up in a home with domestic violence. She was sexually assaulted by one of mom's on again, off again boyfriends when she was 12. She started using when she was 12 and her friend, the bottom, her friend started selling to her as a 12 year old. So got a 12 year old selling to a 12 year old. And they walked through middle school and high school together, not friends, acquaintances. A friend got in with two pimps, text, and Chloe takes off and boom. And they move her north and she, she recognized generally where she was. Ran 911, two troopers, two trauma informed troopers brought her in. And they, 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 they were wonderful because one of the things that happened, and again, this is, this is, this is Heather's statute come to life. You know, they always said they would kill her mother and her two younger siblings. So these troopers, they did what troopers do. They found out where mom lived. They dispatched, Sean sent two units to mom up there, mom and the younger siblings. Said, pack five days of stuff and we're moving you out of here. They did security on the house to get mom out of there. Said, where won't so-and-so know where you might go? and moved her out so they could conduct an investigation. And Nicole comes. I don't know how she and her team do what they do every day. Because the compassion and the knowledge and doing this with somebody who is at perhaps their most violated. We discussed when, when Nicole showed up, the floor nurse, Jen and I, we hadn't yet talked about a rape kit. What do you got, two? Five. Oh, thank you. We got, we, we hadn't yet talked about it. Nicole came and so we discussed how to approach her. And we went into the bay and we talked to her. And she said, Okay, okay. I said, okay, I'm out of here. Nicole and Jen will take care of it, you know, and drew the curtain and she said, don't leave. So three different times during what Nicole and Jen were doing to care for her, to do the kit, Chloe said to me, are you still there? You know, every male in this room, including right here, we are the face of a John. We are the face of what a John, the purchaser, purchase, or purchaser of commercial serial rape looks like, which means any of us. We can also be the face of a trafficker. I got her in. 36 hours later, she walked out the door. I cried like a baby. She called her hotline a couple of times. Two months later, I happened to pick it up 
And she said, it's really bad out here. Can I come home? You saw our shelter. It's not the Four Seasons. It is safe. But it's loaded with survivors. Right now, 22 beds we have for domestic violence and trafficking survivors. We have two open beds. By midnight, they'll be gone for women and women and, and their accompanying children. Brought her back in. She stayed for about a week. And again, this is something, you know, Jesse, you're shaking your head. Nicole shaking her head. Heather shaking her head. I mean, I, Carrie sees this too through the reports. The drugs, the life, the normalization of the upside down claws you back. Even when you're offered services and help. And then about six months later, she called again and came back four months pregnant, heroin and meth. She stayed for two weeks and left again. She, she is why we do what we do, because no one deserves this. No one wakes up in their bed as a 12-year-old girl or boy and says, you know what? I want to be commercially, serially raped or enslaved for the rest of my life. No one. And that is why it is so important that we're all here. All right. Now, now turning this over to Jesse and Carrie. And they're going to do about 45 minutes of trafficking 101. They would normally do one to two hours. And so they're cut down too. But the idea is, again, every slide is a violation of the law of the Commonwealth, but also it's the real stuff. And what our, one of our hopes is that you leave here with actionable information. You, none of us know when we might save somebody's life by making a call. Get your. Um, Thank you, Steve. Um, again, my name is Carrie Dwyer, and I'm an intelligence analyst at the Pennsylvania Criminal Intelligence Center. Um, we're Pennsylvania's main fusion center, so we're within the Pennsylvania State Police. Again, I'm assigned to our organized crime section, so I uh, work with closely with our organized crime troopers who handle organized crime cases to include human trafficking. So it's just a little human trafficking 101, whether you're familiar with what human trafficking is, taken um, trainings before or courses in human trafficking, you'll know that this is the universal standard definition of what human trafficking is. It's a form of modern day slavery in which a trafficker is going to use force, fraud, and coercion to control a victim into engaging in commercial sex acts or labor services against his or her will. It's estimated that there's currently 20 million victims of human trafficking worldwide. A lot of people tend to confuse human trafficking and human smuggling, um, but the reality is that they're two completely um, different crimes. So human trafficking is completely involuntary. The trafficker is gonna take advantage of whatever, vulner whatever vulnerabilities that that victim has. So whether it's just loneliness or some sort of um, addictions, the trafficker is gonna exploit those vulner vulnerabilities to be able to get them to do whatever it is that they want them to do. So human smuggling is actually completely voluntary. The person who's engaging in the smuggling is complicit in the crime. Human smuggling has to involve the crossing of the international borders. With human trafficking, you don't even have to leave your own home to be trafficked. So a common myth is that human trafficking is not occurring in the United States. You know, people think it's like some sort of third world country issue, um, but the reality is it's happening every single day. And yes, it's happening in Pennsylvania and here in central Pennsylvania. It's a $150 billion industry worldwide. And 9.8 of that is in the United States alone. 
So who can be a victim of human trafficking? Anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter age, doesn't matter race, doesn't matter gender, it doesn't matter if they're homeless on the streets or if they come from a wealthy family. Anybody can be a victim of human trafficking as long as they have that some sort of vulnerability that that trafficker is going to want to be able to take advantage of to, again to get them to do whatever it is that they want them to do. So it's estimated that every 30 seconds another victim becomes um, or another person becomes a victim of trafficking and that there's 100,000 children in the United States who are currently victims of human trafficking. So to differentiate between the different types of human trafficking, so the first is the commercial sexual exploitation of children. So children under the age of 18 who are induced into commercial sex with or without the use of force, fraud, and coercion. Second being sex trafficking, so adults 18 or older who are induced into commercial sex, again, through that use of force, fraud, and coercion. And third being labor trafficking. So adults or children who are forced into labor services, again, through that use of force, fraud, and coercion. And to highlight the differences um, with commercial sexual exploitation of children, um, they, you don't have to prove that there is force, fraud, and coercion involved. If it's a child under the age of 18, they can't consent. So it's automatically going to be considered human trafficking. Uh, just, just specific types of force, fraud, and coercion. I know Heather was kind of going into the um, legal talk about that earlier, but for, so for sex trafficking, um, they're going to induce or exploit sus substance abuse issues. So if they have drug addiction or an alcohol addiction, um, they're going to use that to their advantage. They're going to be physically abused. Um, they're going to be raped by that trafficker. They're going to intimidate them using weapons. So they're going to hold knives to their throats. They're going to choke them. Uh, they're going to hold a gun to their head, do whatever it is that they can do to get that victim to comply. Um, they're going to abuse them emotionally, especially if that victim has young children. You know, they're going to threaten to put their child out on the street um, if they uh, don't do what that trafficker wants them to do. So for labor trafficking, the types of force, fraud, and coercion, they're going to withhold their pay. They're going to threaten their, to um, harm their families back home and a lot of times labor trafficking victims are gonna come from other countries. So they're gonna you know, say, hey, I'm gonna go back to Guatemala and have your um, family killed. They're gonna make them work excessive working hours. They're gonna to threaten to report them to immigration. They're gonna be physically abused as well. They're gonna intimidate them using weapons as well. Just same types of tactics as sex trafficking victims. So these are the three R's that we talk about with human trafficking, especially when we go out and do law enforcement presentations. So recognize the indicators, learn about what those indicators are for that victim. So whether it's physical indicators, you know, tattoos, um, just drug um, needle marks and any type of physical act indicators, um, know what the behavioral indicators, um, anytime you would come in, come in contact of a potential victim of human trafficking. Rethink the situation in order to be able to respond appropriately and refer um, that case for investigation by law enforcement. So it's just like a graphic to show you how sex and labor trafficking can kind of um, be intertwined with different types of investigation. So if it's a runaway 14 year old girl, well, think about who was she communicating with before she ran away. If she's communicating with, uh, you know, an older male whom she's calling her daddy or maybe her boyfriend, well, those are maybe potential indicators that maybe she's being tra um, trafficked. Um, gangs, gangs are turning to human trafficking versus drug trafficking because it's a lot easier. Domestic violence calls, um, there could be um, calls between the trafficker and the victim. A lot of times they're, you know, the trafficker's gonna beat them. So um, sometimes the victims are gonna be able to um, call 911 to report those incidents and um, yeah, drug, drug cases as well. So victims can be pretty much recruited anywhere. They can be recruited from within their families. They can be recruited by a gang member. Um, they can be recruited by a guy who's you know, trying to be their boyfriend. Um, but another way is online. Um, so I'm gonna focus just on that one today. So social media, Facebook, Instagram, um, applications, dating applications, Bumble, Tinder, Grindr, all those types of apps that, you know, make us all so vulnerable because we can all, you know, talk behind the screen and we can say whatever we want and we're probably more comfortable than, you know, 
you know, getting up in front of a crowd and uh, talking in front of strangers. But, um, you know, it's, um, we're more comfortable, but we're also more, more vulnerable online, but so are um, trafficking victims. So obviously in 2020, the pandemic has led most of us to um, move a lot of our like social media or social interactions online. Um, but the traffickers, you know, they did, they moved online as well. So uh, we all know the term catfishing. So they could pretend to be, you know, a younger guy to just be able to start communicating with a younger girl that they think um, that they want to start trafficking. So it's a lot easier online. They can use encrypted messages, build the trust of that victim and be able to connect with more victims online than they could in person. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Kick, Plenty of Fish, OkCupid, and Tinder are the most commonly reported social media sites that are reported by human trafficking victims to the National Human Trafficking um, Hotline Center. So those are the ones that they say, you know, the trafficker reached out to me on, um, you know, whichever website. So those are the most common ones. Um, obviously, in 2020, again, we all um, had to move online. So online recruitment by traffickers increased by 22%. There was 125% increase in recruitment on Facebook and 95% increase in recruitment on Instagram. And that's for both sex and labor trafficking. So online, um, the trafficker is gonna gather information to recruit and groom a victim. We all I'm sure know that one person who's posting way too much information about what's going on there in, in their lives, you know, whether they had a breakup, whether they didn't get the job that they wanted, you know, they have no issue, you know, sharing that for everybody, but those are going to be the people that are the most vulnerable to falling victim to, to trafficking. So the traffickers are going to look for those vulnerabilities, They're not going to look for the person who's like living a great life. They're going to look for the ones who are kind of down on their luck and just, you know, um, sharing that for the world. So they'll, you know, send friend requests, follow their pages. Um, they're going to, you know, give them false promises, like such as modeling jobs. You know, you're so beautiful. You know, why don't you come modeling model for me? I, you know, I have this, you know, great company. You'll make great money. You don't have to do much, but those are, again, the people that are, are going to be the easiest to be targeted for trafficking. So this is, um, just come some screenshots, um, so the first one, uh, you know, a guy's targeting or reaching out to a girl because he saw, you know, she broke up with her boyfriend. So he's like, you know, I don't know. He, he doesn't know what he's giving up, you know, but I worry about my daughter. So, you know, that's kind of a vulnerability for her. She has the child, you know, he's like, I, you know, you're vegan. So you like taking care of your body. She asked him if he's a vegan. She's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, of course I am. You know, I respect my body but do we really think he's a vegan? No, he's just trying to find again, that commonality with that girl to be able to kind of, you know, build that relationship and start that grooming process with her. So we can see just in, you know, a handful of messages, how easy it is for somebody just to kind of be, um, fall victim to trafficking. And just some screenshots of some, you know, job opportunities are, that are out there. Um, so in, I know Instagram and Facebook are, commonly used with labor trafficking victims. So if you ever see like job advertisements come to the United States to work, you know, you'll live this great life, make great money. You know, chances are there's probably more going to, on to that story than we um, really think. Uh, this is just an example of a case in which trafficking of the victim was, or social media was used for both the recruitment of the trafficking victim, as well as her ultimate rescue. So a 14 year old girl down in Maryland um, was at a party and she, you know, made some friends with a couple older people and they eventually, you know, exchanged Snapchat IDs. So they, you know, started communicating on Snapchat for a couple of weeks. Well, the, seven, the 17 year old that she was communicating with, you know, sent a message and was like, hey, do you want to make some easy, quick money? 14 year olds like, of course I do, you know, why not? So they went down and picked her up in Maryland um, brought her back up to Eastern Pennsylvania, and they immediately took her to Walmart to buy her provocative clothing. They immediate, immediately took her to a hotel room and started trafficking her that, you know, that very night. So it just happens very quickly. Sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years, but, you know, in that instance, um, it just was a 
all, all within that one day. So she was able to get a hold of a cell phone and she texted her mom on like Facebook Messenger and was like, I don't want to be here anymore. And law enforcement was able to save her at a gas station the next day. Misinformation and disinformation. Um, I'm sure we've heard these terms a lot, probably over the last maybe two or three years. Um, but it's information that's out there on social media that can just easily be misconstrued as factual. You know, we all see somebody sharing some sort of human trafficking story on social media, and we automatically think that it's true. You know, so-and-so shared it. Oh, so it must be true. Um, I don't know if y'all saw the one from a couple years ago with the Wayfair scandal. Yeah, you guys are not in your heads. Like, um, but if you don't know what, what that one was, um, people were alleging that these expensive cabinets um, being sold on Wayfair had the same names as um, missing children. And if you were buying that piece of furniture, you were actually buying a missing child to traffic them, which, you know, I mean, yeah, it just sounds completely bizarre. <laughs> but yeah, these are the types of things that, you know, conspiracy theorists and just misinformation just can be sp spread so quickly and so easily. And everyone just automatically thinks that it's true. Or they're taking pictures of vans in parking lots saying, oh, this van, you know, cr creepy white van in a parking lot, you know, they're trafficking people. So then they'll post it on social media, but it's, you know, just a person taking a break in their van and they're, it's completely harmless. And all that does is, you know, ruin that person's life and reputation, but it also hinders efforts of law enforcement because then they have to, you know, go and combat and it's just, um, just completely not factual. So um, I know places, I know Polaris always has to put out something um, anytime that they see some sort of, um, you know, new crazy story about human trafficking, that, that's just not true. So they always have to put out a story saying, you know, this isn't, you know, factual, like this is just, you know, another conspiracy theorist. And it just kind of takes away from combating real factual and true human trafficking cases. So just be cognizant of what you're re reviewing and sharing on social media and just um, make sure you do your fact checking. Hi, uh, my name is um, Jesse Williams. I'm a Pennsylvania State Trooper. Um, I work in the Bureau of Criminal Investigation in the Organized Crime Unit. And um, I'm the human trafficking coordinator for the Eastern side of the state. And Carrie touched on it a little bit. What we really try to do um, as part of the Pennsylvania State Police is train in indicators and awareness for human trafficking so that our troopers are prepared for when they go out on calls or on the road, or if they're on the side of the road on a traffic stop, that they can actually pick up on some of these indicators and be more aware um, in the event that something is going on that's beyond that stop. So um, what we're seeing in the state of Pennsylvania is the opioid and methamphetamine epidemic um, with, with the drugs and the problems with going on with addiction in the state. There's a lot of people that are doing things they normally wouldn't do in order to maintain that. And we're also seeing traffickers take complete advantage of that. Um, also with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing a lot of decreased protection measures for victims, a lot of resources that are decreased for victims in the state. And we're also seeing people lose their houses, their families. We're seeing a lot of people lose their jobs. So there's a lot more things that people are willing to do that they normally would have never considered. And then we're also seeing a huge uh, transition with gangs and human trafficking. Um, it's a lot less risk for them and a lot more profit than drug trafficking and gun trafficking would be. So a lot of them are actually getting in, involved now with human trafficking. Um, an example that I like to use a lot is if we have a regular patrol trooper on the side of the road and they're doing traffic stops or whatnot and they're doing interdiction on the highway. If there's a gang member who's traveling with a large amount of drugs um, in the car and they're going they get stopped, they get pulled over. They're going to be alert. They're going to be aware. They know that they have something in the car that's illegal. They know that they could get questioned. They know that the car could be searched. So there's different things that they could get hanked up on that some troopers are going to know when it comes to stuff like that. Now, if you have a victim of trafficking in the car, that's a human being. So there's a lot more control that you have over that 
commodity there, which is what they think it is. So they're basically telling them to keep their mouth shut, don't say anything. As long as you don't say anything, you're not gonna get in any kind of trouble. They tell them all the time that you're the one that's going to get in trouble if you open your mouth because you're the one that's committing the crimes. I'm not doing anything. You're the one that's sleeping with all these different people. So this is gonna come down on you. So just make sure that you keep your mouth shut and we'll be fine. So we're seeing gangs transition a lot more now into human trafficking because they're making a lot more money. Yes. And this is why, I mean, what you suggested, she's doing a, a lot of intensive training for troopers in terms of the mechanics of a car stop and traffic, you know, investigation 101 is, is, and this is, that benefits then Heather too, when she's taking a case or can take a case is separating all the passengers in the vehicle and watch the stories fall apart. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's the beauty of, of great policing that she is teaching troopers in terms of let's get everybody out of the vehicle, spread them out and see, and see what, see how the stories differ mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who's doing what to who. Yes. Um, we like to talk a lot about, um, we do go in depth with both labor and sex trafficking and like our longer presentations. Um, sex trafficking, we touch a lot on, and I know that there's statistics out there. Carrie said that it's $150 billion a year industry. $9.8 billion of that is derived from the United States alone. 60% of that 9.8 billion is solely from the profits of sex trafficking. So um, sex trafficking is the commercial sex act that's induced by force, fraud, or coercion. And like we had said before, if you're under the age of 18, you can't consent. So it's automatically considered sex trafficking. This is the fastest growing crime in the United States. And it's second financially only to drug trafficking. Um, it's not yet surpassed it, but it's well on its way there. So like I had said before, sex trafficking and drug trafficking, um, a, lot less, a lot less risk with sex trafficking. It's very easy to hide from law enforcement. Um, you have a reusable resource as opposed to drug trafficking or just being in possession of the drug is a crime. Having somebody sit next to you in the car is not illegal. So if that's the only thing that they're worried about, there's a lot less risk involved in that. Um, being in possession of the drug is a crime. You have an expendable resource. If you're taking a drug from one place to another, that drug is then no longer in your possession. That drug also has to be split up, cut, used in different ways, delivered to people and spread out. So you can't, once that drug is gone and used, it's gone. With a human, it's reusable. You can be used over and over and over again. Um, sex trafficking, they're always looking for the next victim. And like Carrie explained, you can virtually find that absolutely anywhere. Um, internet sites act as a worldwide marketplace. And then for drug trafficking, the profit margin is usually controlled by the suppliers and it's usually sold mainly to personal contacts. Um, one thing I always usually like to touch on is just pretty much sex sells. It really does. And it's sad to say, but this is one thing that is very beneficial to a sex trafficker. So this is a very lucrative business, like we had said, and this is a very, very conservative example. Um, if you have one day, one trafficker, two victims, if they're charging $100 per each client and they have five clients each, it's $1,000 per day. They are not spending a lot of money to upkeep and to maintain their victims. Um, everything that you've ever heard about pretty woman and stuff like that in your head, just throw it out. Cause that's not, that's not the world that we're living in. Um, $15 for food. Sometimes they'll get really cheap hotel rooms. that will have like continental breakfast. So they don't have to spend money on food. That'll be the only time that the victim eats $10 for condoms. Maybe sometimes they use them. Sometimes they don't, uh, like I said, cheap hotel rooms. So that could be the profit for the day. And you see the week, the month and the year, this is very lucrative, very conservative. And now I don't even believe that some of the victims that we're talking to and we're interviewing are even charging $100 per client anymore. Usually it's upwards in 200, 300, $400 range now. Um, as, as I continue to do this and the longer and longer I'm doing it and working, um, prostitution and sex trafficking a lot, especially with officers and troopers, um, they're used synonymously, those two terms. And what we do is we really go out and we try to like break down the difference between the both so that we can see what would be sex trafficking and what prostitution looks like. So prostitution, 
old term. We kind of don't, we, tr we try to stray away from using it now. It is commercial sex work. Um, it is a choice. You have the freedom to do and, you know, see who you want to see. You make your own decisions regarding what, when, where, how. Um, you have control of your own money. You have your own personal documents. You do everything that you want to do because you're doing it and you're making that choice. Sex trafficking victims didn't choose the lifestyle. Even if it was a choice in the beginning and they were involved in the commercial sex industry, they could still become a trafficking victim. So they didn't choose the lifestyle. They're not free to leave. Um, they don't, they're not able to make decisions regarding the clients and the clientele that they're seeing. And they don't make the decisions about what they're doing. Um, and they also may not, or they might not have control of their own documents, they may, um, I don't like to tell people that a sex trafficking victim is going to have or not going to have their ID on them because sometimes they might. Um, it's all about the different tactics, tactics that the trafficker uses against that victim. So who is vulnerable? Um, and like we've all been explaining, victims of trafficking have specific vulnerabilities that can make them easily susceptible to traffickers. So starting off as children, um, if you come from a hard home, children that have parents that are drug addicted, alcohol problems, if you've been phys uh, psychologically, physically, sexually abused as a child, um, if your health and safety have been affected by poverty, uh, violence, lack of access to education, and if you're in foster care, and a big one is runaways. Um, there's different statistics on runaways. Um, if you run away, I believe it's more than three times um, you're 78% more likely to be approached by a trafficker. And a lot of runaways will come back and report that within the first 48 hours of them running away, they actually have been approached by a trafficker. And then those children, they grow up and they become adults with those same vulnerabilities. Um, they become either or have had problems in the past or current problems with drug addiction and alcohol addiction. They may not have strong family support system or ties to people that can support them. Um, they may have different issues with financial stability and also um, people that have mental disabilities. So where is law enforcement coming into contact with traffickers? It's absolutely everywhere. And this is why we go out and we train on the awareness and the indicators because it's happening on traffic stops, domestic incidences, disturbances. When they are looking into missing people, which involves runaways, um, people with drug addictions, and controlled substance addictions, um, and then arrests, when people are arresting individuals for retail theft, um, for prostitution. So these are things that where, you know, law enforcement in the past has just been constantly arresting people for drugs and retail theft and prostitution, and they think that it's, you know, a pattern of that person's behavior. This is where we're starting to look further into that pattern. Why are they stealing? Why are they, why are they involved in the commercial sex industry? And um, why are they using drugs? Um, suicide attempts, and pretty like anywhere, which is what we've been saying. So who are we coming into contact with when we are doing these types of investigations and these types of incidents? We're coming into contact with victims, traffickers, um, commercial sex buyers, which is a big one, witnesses, and the witnesses span all over from hotel workers to taxi drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers, store employees, restaurant employees and restaurant owners, um, bystanders that are just there, people that are working uh, tellers at banks and different things like that. So they're really absolutely anywhere, people that could be witnesses to what's going on around them. Like I said, um, runaway, so 2.8 million children run away each year worldwide. Within 48 hours, they'll most likely be approached by a trafficker. One in seven runaways reported missing were most likely victims of sex trafficking. And then children that run away three or more times are 78% more likely to be trafficked. So indicators that we like to touch on and that we like to teach about so that law enforcement is aware and so that actually the general public is also aware of what to look for. Um, big thing like I know before I started doing this type of work, I the, my go to movie for what I thought trafficking looked like was um, the one with Liam Neeson taken. That's it. Yeah. 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 Like I that's exactly what I thought it was. I was like, oh, it doesn't it doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen. in I mean, I yeah. In yeah. Taken, I mean, I love these former spy that, you know, he's got like 97 ways to, to do things, you know what? But if, if, if 
pretty woman, or if taken were the trafficking problem, we all would be happily unemployed <laughs> battling trafficking because that ain't it. We have never seen the girl whose multimillionaire parents buy her or rent her a $15,000 a month Champs-Elysees apartment, and then she ends up in shelter. I'm yeah. waiting. Yeah. But, sorry, I just, no, I, okay. but I mean, but yeah. yeah, it's like clearly that's great, you know, taken great action movie, not, not, not a real thing to it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I always thought that it was. So what we really try to stray away from is what you would think human trafficking looks like so that you're not thinking and looking for one thing and that you're looking for something else. Um, so I, I think I was just it like recently just happened a survivor um, did a TED talk, Rebecca Bender. I don't know if anybody's heard of her, but um, she actually just did a TED talk where she explained some statistics surrounding that and um, less than 1% of trafficking happens by abduction. So 99% of trafficking is occurring. It's familial or it's gang driven or pimp driven. Um, this is the kind of trafficking that we're talking about. And if we're thinking of all the different things like what Carrie was talking about and what she touched on with the Wayfair, um, you know, children being sold and stuff like that, we're missing, we're missing the rest of trafficking. So um, what we are doing is trying to make sure that people that we teach and that we, when we speak on it is that they're aware of the indicators so that we're not missing things. Um, physical indicators, signs of current physical abuse. Sometimes this is there and sometimes it's not there. It can be really hard. Like what I said, um, people that are in bondage and tape and all that kind of stuff, we're trying to steer away from that because it's not what we're seeing. Um, we are seeing sometimes bruising in various stages, but sometimes we're not seeing bruising. Um, we are seeing scarring, tattoos and branding, and sometimes we're not. So it's really hard to you know, pinpoint exactly a physical sign of what somebody would look like if they're being trafficked. But what we do see um, are signs of current physical neglect. So we are seeing individuals that are malnourished, they're exhausted, they're disoriented. They may have inappropriate clothing for the weather. Um, we've seen victims that are completely dressed inappropriate for winter months. Um, we've seen people that have no clue where they are. They don't know that they're in the state of Pennsylvania. They thought that they were somewhere else. They're not sure what street they're on. They're not, they don't remember, you know, where they came from. Um, and they are absolutely exhausted. I mean, these victims are doing what they're told, being told to do day in and day out, all day, day in and day out. They're not eating, they're not sleeping properly. They're abusing drugs. So um, being given drugs as well. So uh, we are seeing that. And then we do see signs of illicit drug use. So injection sites, paraphernalia, and obviously the intoxicated behavior. These are just some exam examples of tattoos and branding that we're talking about. Um, the barcode, obviously we have like different people that you know, have initials on them with like crowns over it. Anything that would say property of or daddy's girl or anything like that is going to obviously like, you know, make the hair on your neck stand up. Um, and then a big thing for me is when we do certain interviews or we're talking to victims, we're talking to, you know, young girls or girls that are in their twenties and thirties and things like that. Anybody that has a name tattooed on them, especially if it's a female with a male name tattooed on them. Um, you know, I have tattoos. I don't have any names tattooed on me and I don't think I ever would. <laughs> so like, you know, you have to ask these kinds of questions. Who is that? Who, you know, did somebody ask you to get that? And a lot of girls will tell us like, oh, that's my boyfriend. And, you know, you know that it's not, that it's not there and that it's not, it shouldn't be there and stuff like that. So dig, dig deeper. We try and dig deeper into those questions. Some behavioral indicators that we're seeing, like I said before, disoriented. Um, they have a lack of knowledge as to travel plans, their current location, where they came from, where they're going. Um, they could lie about their age and their identity. That's big for minors that are involved in the commercial sex world. Um, they're, they're definitely going to tell you that they're 18 years old. They could be giving you the information of another female that they know that's in their group um, that's working with them. And then we also have um, the accepts verbal abuse without resistance. It's very easy. If somebody tells them to shut up or look away or don't say anything, they just do it. Um, lack of eye contact with law enforcement. They also have a very strong fear for law enforcement, lack of trust with law enforcement. They don't wanna to talk to us. They don't wanna look at us because the whole time they're being told constantly that they're gonna get in trouble for what they're doing, that they're the ones that are committing crimes. They're the ones that are using drugs. They're the prostitutes. So they're going to constantly be scared and 
you know, nervous to talk to law enforcement. And then also they appear to be under the control of another person. So they usually don't speak without the permission of another. They allow others to speak for them, um, looking to the trafficker to constantly answer a question. And then um, this is a huge one too, staying in the immediate area of another person, um, constantly being near somebody, constantly having that person right with you because you're not going, they're not going to, and like Steve was saying, separating people, uh, law enforcement, we do it all the time. We do it on domestics. We separate people so that we can get one side of the story and another side of the story and so that we can build an investigation. That's huge with a victim of trafficking and a trafficker. They are not going to want to be pulled apart. Some situational indicators, they may or may not hold their own identification, may or may not hold their own money and credit cards. Sometimes they may just have enough on them. The trafficker might trust them enough to let them go get some fast food or something like that. Um, they may have a cell phone. This is big. Um, we do see that a lot of victims now have cell phones. They have cell phones in their possession. They have multiple cell phones in their possession, cell phones to speak with traffickers, cell phones to speak with commercial sex buyers. So we are seeing that. Um, only provocative clothing, few or no personal possessions, and may not have basic healthcare essentials. A big thing with that too, a lot what we say um, on traffic stops is like an unnecessary amount of feminine hygiene products. Um, and like only that is one of the big indicators that we see for human trafficking. Because like I said before, they're not maintaining a lot of upkeep on their victims. So it is kind of, you know, there's, and like you had said in that story before, like Chloe, she didn't, she had like, she was like, oh, there's a shower there. Cause they, a lot of times these victims aren't, you know, maintaining proper hygiene. So the trafficker won't let them. Um, they're just wiping themselves off and moving on. So physical indicators that we see, um, whether they're in rooms, homes, hotels, different places like that, presence of multiple hotel key cards, fast food wrappers, receipts, uh, cell phones, computers, condoms, lubricants, baby wipes, like I had explained earlier, um, luggage containing only provocative clothing and shoes, um, papers that could possibly note internet sites, uh, notebooks, ledgers. Um, sometimes they do keep an actual track of how many clients they're seeing and how much they're making so that their trafficker knows that they're not getting stiffed on any kind of money. Uh, drugs, paraphernalia, tattoos, branding, and also prepaid credit cards. So switching gears to labor trafficking, I think when people think of human trafficking, they just automatically think of sex trafficking, but they have to understand that labor trafficking um, is also out there. Again, um, like it doesn't get reported or talked about as often as sex trafficking. So one of the things I um, do for our presentations is try, try to get the word out there about labor trafficking more. Um, and it probably isn't as, you know, um, Glamorous as you know the sex trafficking, but um, it's important to know and understand what labor trafficking is. So, to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline in 2020, there were only 1,052 cases of labor trafficking reported, and of that, there were only 21 cases for Pennsylvania. So, um, I know for uh, sex trafficking, I think there were over 10,000 cases reported to the hotline in 2020. So, it just kind of shows you the, um, the drastic differences in numbers of cases that get reported. Um, a, a big um, reason for that being is just awareness and victims just don't wanna come forward. A lot of them are foreign nationals, so they're um, not gonna speak English and they're not really gonna know or understand that what's happening to them is illegal. So who could be a victim of labor trafficking? Um, just like sex trafficking, anybody, doesn't matter you know, if they're a US citizen or if they're a foreign national. Uh, women, men, children, um, anybody can be a victim of labor trafficking. So the exploited vulnerabilities for labor trafficking, um, immigration status is going to be the biggest thing. Um, so, you know, a lot of them are going to come from other countries to come to the United States to live a better life, you know, make more money, make enough money so that they can bring their families over as well. Um, but those are going to be the people who are most vulnerable to um, labor trafficking. Um, cognitive impairments. So um, sometimes labor trafficking victims can be an elderly individual who is suffering from dementia. Um, I've seen a case where um, an elderly person with dementia was, you know, forced to clean a house, but then they were also forced to live in a cage in the basement of that house. 
Um, so it's um, these victims are definitely much um, treated just as poorly as a sex trafficking is. Um, they're going to um, pay a recruitment debt. So a lot of times labor trafficking victims are going to be paid to come to the United States. Um, but if you think that money was, you know, free of charge, no, they have to pay that recruitment debt off. And sometimes the trafficker will tack on additional fees. And obviously they're making little to no money. So it almost becomes impossible for them to pay off those recruitment debts. And the trafficker is going to take advantage of the fact that that victim doesn't know or understand any of the U.S. culture and labor laws. Again, uh, labor trafficking victims come to the US, U.S. to live a better life. You know, they just um, aren't having a, you know, they come from, you know, really poor countries. So they come to the United States with those job opportunities that maybe they've heard through social networks back at home, you know, word of mouth, you know, so-and-so, I heard so-and-so, you know, got this job back in the United States, you know, talk to this recruiter. Um, so it just becomes word of mouth or they see it on social media sites as well. Um, all the different types of jobs that they can get. Um, a lot of times um, a labor trafficker is gonna have a recruiter working on their behalf to be able to reach out to those victims. Um, so the recruiters can be like the third or the middleman in the situation. They're gonna use false promises, high coercive tactics to get the victims to commit to that job offer. And a lot of times um, victims are gonna pay on average $6,150 in those recruitment fees. So there are just two kind of examples of um, labor trafficking victims. The first victim, their paycheck was less than $200 after the trafficker took out um, passport fees and other document fees. They ultimately were charged for food, housing, and transportation, um, even though they told, were told when they came to the US that that would all be free of charge for them. And their timesheets were marked 40 hours a week, even though they were working 60 to 70 hours and the paychecks were you know, less than $500. Second victim, they signed a contract in their home country saying that they were gonna make $1,400 a week in the US, free housing and free food. I mean, I think anybody would wanna jump at that opportunity, especially with you know, gas prices and food prices and just you know, the overall cost of living nowadays, like anybody would be, you know, jump at that at um, any given chance. Once that victim came to the United States, they had to sign a second contract. Then that trafficker tacked on a fee for a $2,000 fee for additional paperwork. Um, the victim ended up having to pay for utilities, water, electric, even though they were told all of that was free of charge for them. They worked 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. Um, they weren't allowed to take any sick leave. Um, so these victims are, you know, forced in, you know, on a sunny, hot day in the middle of summer, if you think that they're getting, you know, adequate breaks from the sun or adequate water breaks or food breaks, or just any, you know, chances to take a break to get some medical care, if you think that's happening, it's not. The traffickers want some to be out on that farm or wherever it is that they're working um, just to get the work done. So um, what to know before you have uh, contact with a potential victim, and this is something that we teach a lot with our um, with law enforcement, is that there are specific barriers um, that you have. They rarely ever, ever, if ever, identify themselves as a victim of um, sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Uh, they rarely see themselves as victims, and then they have that significant mistrust of law enforcement. So it's very difficult for them to even come out and say, you know, say this to anybody. Um, they almost will never tell the whole story the first time. And um, a big thing that that can be with law enforcement is that most of the time law enforcement will think that they're automatically lying to them. Um, so we do a minimal facts interview and it's always essential. Um, and it's not about if they're lying because sometimes we do know that they are, but it's more so why are they lying? And that's what we're trying to change when it comes to um, law enforcement response to different things. Uh, psychological trauma is very common with victims. Uh, many victims suffer from PTSD, Stockholm syndrome. They have a relationship and a bond with their traffickers, good or bad, whether they know it or whether they don't know it, they do have that bond. And like Steve even said too, like the trauma bonding that they do have, they also have that with other victims that they've been around. And um, they sometimes can tend to have positive feelings for their traffickers and also positive feelings for other victims that they've 
you know, built those relationships with. So it is very hard to break that, to break that bond and to break that up. Um, victims also fear retribution from their traffickers. If they don't work enough, if they're sick, if they don't make enough money, um, if they cooperate with law enforcement or police in any kind of way, um, that can also lead to a lot of fear. And um, that's a lot of the tactics that traffickers will use. So they are programmed to believe that running away from them and into the arms of help will you know, ultimately end up in violence and ultimately end up in a lot of promised threats that the trafficker has given to the victim over a course of time. So trying to build that trust and developing that good rapport with a victim is like the biggest thing that we have. Um, your interaction with them is always going to be critically important. That first interaction with them is the most important. Um, treating them with respect, uh, letting them know that, you know, um, uh, treating them with respect, I'm sorry, it makes them more cooperative and it also helps build a better memory for them so that they can actually put things in order um, instead of just, you know, berating them with questions and things like that where they could tend to panic and not really remember the order of which things happened. Trust and rapport is built over time. It takes multiple different talks, multiple different interviews. Um, sometimes four, five, six interviews in, we still aren't building that trust and rapport. And it could be the next one that they'll end up opening up to somebody. Um, so your response ultimately is going to affect the victim. Um, you're always gonna set the tone. So we always try to do these things in a private calm setting, um, you know, like, in a police interview room is probably not the best place to do these types of interviews at. Um, fulfilling the immediate needs of the victim first. It's okay, yep. Fulfilling their immediate needs first, um, making sure that they're you know, hunger, satiated, thirst, things like that. Um, if they need medical attention, comfort, clothing. Um, initial rejection of services is always common and usually it is common throughout the different you know, uh, interviews that we do. Um, making sure we set boundaries, confirming their ages and their identities, and reassuring the victim without making any promises. So just being prepared, knowing that they have a conflicted loyalty to the trafficker, um, that they've always relied on the trafficker for their basic needs is always, and then, you know, that they could object and be standoffish to negative conversation about the trafficker. Knowing that going in can help you build that trust and rapport. And then knowing also that they have complex trauma and substance abuse issues possibly that have been you know, occurring for if not their entire life. And then also the biggest thing, available services and getting to know your NGOs and the different people that you work with, interpreters, social workers, um, and then trauma response teams that can help and assess and help law enforcement in these types of investigations. Four million gigabytes of information. Wow. All right. Cole. And I got to tell you, every, everything these guys said, everything, it, it, we could go for hours talking about war stories, details, et cetera. And, uh, but thanks team, you go. Hi, my name is Nicole Basil. I'm the unit director of the UPMC Forensic Nursing Department. Um, I'm gonna kind of focus more on if I'm the victim survivor, I'm gonna label that person as a, our patient. Um, I'm a nurse, so when they come into the emergency department or come into a medical office, um, kind of the steps in the process that we take um, to care for these patient population. So I kind of wanted to give a very brief overview of forensic nursing. A lot of people think we're like CSI, like we're the TV show. Um, that's just unrealistic. I mean, we're not trying to be detectives. Um, you know, the crime lab takes longer than that hour. You know, the date rape panel, drugs, or even the sexual assault evidence collection kit results come back before that commercial break. So there's a lot that goes into forensic nursing. In the past, we have had multiple names. Um, to put it like a more specific, it's SANE, which stands for Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner, Safe Sexual Assault Forensic Examiner, or Sexual Assault Forensic Exam. Forensic Nurse Examiner is more of that broad term because we do more than just sexual assaults. Um, 
forensic nursing is when that health and that legal system kind of intersects and combines. We have specialized education and clinical training to do our jobs. Um, we're always looking for evidence-based practice when we need to change our practice and when we need to update policies and, and our procedures. We're very in tuned in practice, providing that trauma-informed victim-centered care to our patients. We'll spend hours with our patients to make sure they're given the appropriate information, the appropriate resources, and again, all the options that they have um, that Pennsylvania offers victims of crime. So our medical forensic examinations are related to any abuse, violence, or any criminal activity. Along with this specialized education, we have to be updated on the knowledge of the Pennsylvania laws. For one, how can we protect our patients? And for another, when do we have to do a mandated report? Um, when do we have to report these certain laws? <clears throat> So about our program, um, we're a 24-7 program. We're available every day, holidays, nights, weekends. We are a mobile unit. So we travel to all seven UPMC hospital sites within central PA region. Um, we are a very small team. So it does um, take us a while maybe, especially if we have to like come from Harrisburg and travel to Hanover, um, but we can do in-person. Um, forensic exams. We do consults by phone and actually telehealth. Um, we're involved in four counties, um, so we have to know their procedures and apologies for each county. So just not with sexual assault, our forensic nursing services, we offer services and we see patients who are suspected child physical abuse, um, somebody that comes into the hospital that reports domestic violence or intimate partner violence, um, non-fatal strangulation, we can collect evidence, um, examine that patient and provide resources. Um, of course, human trafficking, um, elder sexual and physical abuse. Um, we have a lot of programs um, with people that are in prison, like institutional and then military sexual assault. So we're aware of how they report their terminology as well. Nicole, I just want to add, Nicole has been accepted as Yes, in multiple counties in criminal cases. So, I mean, when she testifies, she, you know, she is, a, the, you know, the, the defense lawyer will go through the rigmarole, blah, blah, blah. And she has been universally accepted by every judge she's been in front of as an expert witness. And her testimony is devastating. So we study a lot. Um, a lot of articles I kind of memorize so I can um, quote if I am ever called to testify and they do call an expert and I mentioned something and I want to know exactly um, how to quote what I, um, my expertise and, and what I'm explaining. So our medical forensic examination, um, it could take hours. It's just, it's not, they come into the emergency department, you're seen, you're discharged. Um, so we do a complete head to toe examination. Um, while we're examining our patient, we're looking for any injury um, where we can take photographs, any um, like palpitation if they feel tenderness and anywhere we can possibly take that evidence. So based on that patient's history of events, so what they, what they um, disclose on their interview is what we're gonna base our exam on. We do do a genital examination we do, um, it's not like a pap smear, but we do a speculum examination. State of Pennsylvania forensic nurses or SANES are permitted to do these type of exams because it's non-diagnostic. So we're not doing a pap smear. We're not testing for cancer or any medical issues. We're specifically looking for injury and collecting that evidence. So with injury, we have to be, we have to know our normal variants compared to injury. So we have to be very, specialized in how to identify injuries. We do um, take photographs of these injuries. Two, after the patient leaves to document, which that's another two to three hours, um, we document intensively. Um, we wanna do our thorough documentation to give to law enforcement, or if we have to testify, we want our chart to be as perfect as perfect can be. We go through a peer review process, make sure we didn't miss anything, make sure our photos match our injuries. We also 
offer our patients sexually transmitted infection prophylaxis treatment um, and also testing and treatment for HIV and other bloodborne um, pathogens. So our role as a forensic nurse, um, again, very, I, my team, when I do, when they do preset them, I emphasize to give that compassionate, comprehensive trauma-informed care. Um, we ask detailed questions, especially with human trafficking patients. Um, we take our time. They're not going to tell us a lot, even with sexual assault times, especially when we deal with like pediatric patients. Um, so we ask this detail, we take our time, try to gain that rapport. We, the head to toe examination to collect that biological and trace evidence. Along with the photo documentation, um, we also collect for drug facilitated. So if somebody can't remember parts of the evening, um, whether it's due to alcohol or drugs, whether it's a sexual assault or human trafficking, um, we will collect that drug facilitated to kind of determine what type of drugs are in the system, which I can get a little tricky. Uh, these type of drug facilitators, um, these drugs come into somebody's body quickly and they leave quickly. So it, it's very pertinent to obtain that blood or urine specimen as soon as possible. Um, along with the documentation, we maintain chain of custody and again, provide that support resource without in the community. There is multiple community resources such as the YWCA um, that we offer that patient those services. We do do a follow-up care about two weeks. We'll call the patient to make sure there's anything that we can do or something they don't understand. Um, we give them a lot of information. They're talking to multiple people and that patient might not remember everything that we told them and everything that went on that day. And of course, um, like Steve, so we testify in court. About the chain of custody, um, on that legal aspect, this is very important. So if a sexual assault or human trafficking um, comes in and we do collect evidence, we have to maintain that ch chain of custody. And this is always asked in court, how did I ma maintain this chain of custody? So it's who identifies, who has possession of this evidence. So once we collect it, it's always with us until it's um, sealed. And we state that we, the drying, the packaging, the labeling, the sealing, and the storing of the evidence that we've done this. Um, nobody has access to, except for myself, or maybe possibly like the other forensic nurses. So it documents that exchange of evidence. When law enforcement comes to pick up our sexual assault evidence collection kit, there's a form that we fill out. Um, and with signatures that I gave it to this to this law enforcement, and then they'll give that to the crime lab. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so human trafficking in healthcare, eighty eight percent of trafficking survivors have been in contact with a healthcare provider during their captivity. It was also reported sixty three percent of those survivors have been seen in the emergency department. I've just looked, I've been, I worked in the emergency department probably going on 15 some years. I could just imagine how many potential heat trafficking victims that we missed before I was educated on this. Um, just for the like the red flags and the signs, you know, that we learned about that I never knew. I think nurses are critical in assessing this situation. Um, so some of the warning signs, um, I know this was all discussed before, but in the ER, when we're doing our head to toe assessment, whether working as an emergency department nurse or working as a forensic nurse, we're always looking um, for these signs. Bald patches may be from being pulled by the hair, um, poor dental care, um, not knowing what city they're in or, or what, you know, even state. There's multiple STIs, um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, if they're coming in with multiple abortions or miscarriages. Um, again, that substance abuse, um, suicide attempts. Um, a lot, if they're coming with injuries and that those injuries doesn't just doesn't match that history of events that they provided us. So it's just not consistent from what they're telling us. Um, no identification. And then um, that visitor speaking for them, them not being able to speak for themselves. So we train the emergency department to kind of notice it's whether they're doing their assessment. And then they'll call us 
And then we kind of do a further assessment. A lot of times our patients don't really let us know something's going on, whether it's a sexual assault, sexual abuse. Everybody responds to trauma a little differently. I've seen people come in um, who's just been sexually assaulted or even Chloe, her emotions were everywhere. I think she had every emotion that evening that Stephen I was with her, um, talkative, quiet. Some patients might even laugh um, thinking, you know, there's nothing going on with this patient. Um, they could be calm. Everybody responds to their trauma differently. However, they're gonna cope is, is, their, is their coping mechanism. I had a patient that took a selfie during a sexual assault exam. Um, so if that's how they cope, um, we kind of we kind of let that. Some delay responses, um, nightmares, sleep problems, which we at discharge, we go over these symptoms and responses that patients might develop just to kind of give them a, an idea of what maybe to look for. The biggest response is fear, just like the sight, smell, sound can kind of trigger flashbacks and um, kind of jeopardize that patient's healing process. So what do we do as a forensic nurse when they do come in the emergency department? So if they are suspected, if any red flags come up and we're called to see a potential traffic victim, of course, just like law enforcement, um, we kind of want to separate the patient and the visitor for kind of different reasons. We don't want to come out and ask the patient, oh my God, you're being trafficked. So I'm going to call this and we're going to do this. And they're going to look and for they're going to look like we're crazy because like you said, most of them don't know they're being trafficked. The other, that visitor that they're with can, can put staff and that patient in serious harm. So number one, we wanna keep ourselves and the patient safe. So we're not gonna ask them if they're being trafficked. We're gonna to try to give them away if they have to give a urine sample. So we'll walk to the bathroom with them. Um, maybe they need an x-ray or a CAT scan that we'll go in, um, which that's always a good um, scenario. Um, we're not gonna be judgmental. We're kind of that trauma-informed care, patient-centered care. In the medical part of potential traffic victims, we're not gonna aim to rescue. More than likely, we're not gonna rescue that place and time, but rather we're gonna empower that victim and provide resources, let them know that they're safe here at the hospital. If they have no other where to go, they can return to the emergency department. Also, this might be our only chance to provide medical care. Um, traffickers are not going to bring their victims in to get like a dentist check or come in just to get, you know, a well-being check. They're going to bring them into the hospital and it starts to affect their work. So when it starts to affect their work, if that's the only time we can provide medical care, then that's what I'm going to focus on the most. Um, along with that patient, if it is something that we develop a, a trafficking situation. Um, we're gonna work, uh, reach out to social work, um, community, community resources, YWCA. If that patient is under um, 18 years and younger, um, we're gonna contact children and youth. So we're mandated reporters. Um, just like you heard before, um, children cannot sell sex. So we have to call law enforcement um, and then just provide that whole multidisciplinary team. So what happened if that, that patient's visitor won't leave? Again, safety. Um, we don't wanna do any harm or risk for that patient. Um, it may be safer to allow that potential traffic or domain in the room. Again, if we can just offer medical care. That's what we're gonna do at that time. Um, we don't wanna risk that opportunity. Um, again, in that safety, main, the main part is that safety. We evaluate case by case. Um, I can't say this is what we're gonna do. Um, we do case by case. So whatever that situation is, whatever we feel is the best, that's what we're gonna do. That's it, so I made good timing. <laughs> wow. Um, number one, Jessica Collier, she is the reason this is happening. So two years in a row, this force of nature has said, 
it is unacceptable to not address trafficking. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, you know, this collective expertise here is just amazing. Um, and also let me apologize again for my emotion. I see we all, we all have, we all have faces and names and people that are permanently tattooed in us. And I, mean, I was just in shelter before I came here. And so when you're there, yeah, we've got two open beds. Like I said, they'll be gone by midnight. Women, both domestic violence and trafficking and children escaping. If you, having some emotion shows that it's real and it's credible. And um, you don't wanna be a blubbering idiot, um, but, but that way there is an authenticity. And that's where, you know, Jessie's on the street and her authenticity and her, and, and as, as we've discussed, I mean, not every cop is trauma informed. You know, and, 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 and a lot of our survivors will report not good experiences. Um, but when you have troopers like Jesse, when you have prosecutors like Heather, um, when, when you've got Carrie backing her up, when you've got Nicole, that it is so important that we non judgmentally approach these people. Do you, do you have some questions? Okay. Okay, the word trafficking implies movement, but as Carrie said, trafficking can occur in your own home. Can you explain? I mean, you want to, you want to, you guys want to grab that? Any one of us? Yeah. Pretty much anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. So that's a common misconception. Um, trafficking does not require any movement. Um, smuggling, as Carrie pointed out is a separate crime. It's a federal crime. It, it does require movement. Um, trafficking can occur by the force, fraud, coercion methods that we've all described and are in the statute, but it absolutely, I would uh, say, rarely requires movement. Um, it, it could have movement, but there's absolutely no requirement of movement for trafficking. Yeah, in fact, at, one of the things that, and, and everybody here talked about the familial trafficking. I mean, in terms of, again, the upside down world of betrayal, your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, older siblings trafficking other people in the house for a variety of reasons. But you can be trafficked from one room in your house or apartment to the next room. You literally, you do not have to move. One of the things that I'm spending, in fact, tomorrow and, and Friday, I'm going to be in Lancaster County with Lancaster County Children and Youth Services doing in-depth trainings because they are seeing they are seeing more and more suspected familial trafficking. Um, and I mean, trafficking generally, labor trafficking, child labor trafficking, but also familial trafficking. So that, you know, that phenomena is, I don't know if it's increasing or we're just getting better at screening and potentially identifying it. Um, I mean, when you think about, and, and also, you know, we actually, we've all talked about domestic violence. Quick stat, since October, 2014, the YWC of Greater Harrisburg has had a, this Pennsylvania Alliance Against Trafficking Humans State Route 15 grant from the US Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime. Since that time, we have seen and worked with hundreds and hundreds of victims, more sex trafficking than labor trafficking, but both. And we will take anybody into shelter if, if they're trafficked. Um, but among those people, 
about 80% of the survivors we have worked with are US citizens and 20% are overseas nationals. The overseas nationals have come from virtually everywhere on this planet. I, we have not yet seen, I don't believe, Australia, New Zealand, or Oceania, but everywhere else. Among the US citizens, I can tell you, well over 95% of our US citizen trafficking survivors grew up in home with domestic violence. Over 95% were sexually assaulted or raped before they were 12, often multiple times. And so does that mean domestic violence, if, you're, if you survive DV, that you're going to be trafficked? No. Does it mean if you survive sexual assault, you're gonna be trafficked? No. But in the world of cumulative trauma, in the world of vulnerability, trauma, brutality, the more vulnerabilities you have, the more susceptible you could potentially be. Uh, let me see if we had another. Oh, wait, and you know what, Heather, you got, you had the least amount of time. Um, do, you, do you have, do you have, do you have a war story you want to take? Cause I, I, I mean, I, I want to make sure you got, you, you have time because I don't want to, Well, you got a solid five minutes. Well, I'll, I'll start by playing off a little bit about what Steve just said about vulnerabilities. Um, I'd, I'd like to also point out, based on my experience in the cases that I've seen that these victims or survivors look like or could look like anybody in this room. They could look like your neighbor, um, your friend's daughter, your daughter, your son. They don't necessarily look like what you picture in these movies and on TV. Um, I would urge you, and I'm gonna piggyback off of something that um, Jesse said, to take a look at the TED Talk by Rebecca Bender because it, she is a survivor, um, she's an advocate, and in, I guess, her 10 minutes of that TED Talk explains, I think the most important takeaway from that is what human trafficking is not. Um, we talked today a lot about what human trafficking is, and it was my job to explain the law um, as a prosecutor and what the law is in Pennsylvania. But as a society and a culture in, in whole, I think the most important takeaway from this is what human trafficking is not in the misconceptions that are out there. Um, the law talks about force, fraud, and coercion. Those are very, very broad terms. These traffickers can prey on anyone with a vulnerability, whether it's big or small. Um, it can happen anywhere it is happening everywhere around us. Um, the, the movement part is, like I said, that's more smuggling. There's absolutely no need for it. It, it generally is, is not happening. Um, it can be movement from a hotel to a hotel, but it's, like we said, less than 1% are, are kidnapping, even though that's what everybody thinks of in, in their mind. Um, most of the victim survivors that I've seen have been recruited either online or on the street, and they have been controlled by their traffickers, either by with, withholding drugs that they needed because they were drug sick or threatening their children, their parents, um, them, themselves. It, it doesn't have to be someone in handcuffs being moved one, one place to another. And, I th and it could happen to anyone. And I think that's, that's the most important takeaway. And we're all here um, trying to debunk the myths and, and educate everyone as to what, what it is that, that's out there. And you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a lot of the information that Jesse and Carrie gave and wrap it into the last two minutes here. Uh, Schaffner Youth Development Center. Schaffner Youth Development Center is a secure juvenile holding facility here in Harrisburg. There's kids there under 18. They're brought there either by court order, chronic runaways, or they're being held 
uh, because they've been arrested or there's an investigation going on. And we get called periodically to go to Schaffner. Uh, and and I've, I've been there a number of times. And I'm gonna tell you real quick about Tasha. Tasha, not her real name. And again, all these things, we're gonna tweak the identities a bit, but the essence of the story is, is true. Tasha, 14, uh, brought in, she was recovered from two adults in New York City who had convinced her through Instagram to come up there. Tasha's story is this. Oh, a, a, a horrifically violent home, domestic violence, substance abuse. Her father kicked her out of the house repeatedly. She kept trying to come back, kicked out. He, the, the father beats the mother and the kid then goes onto social media. Instagram starts pushing out information about what life is like. And this couple from New York reaches out to her and did exactly what Jesse and Carrie said. I mean, just, just oh, you know, well, you're too pretty, you're too this, you, you know, you, you could, we could get you up here. So this kid who's been kicked out of her home, beaten, uh, violence and everything, she responds to this solicitation. They come down and they pick her up and they bring her up to New York. And what they do is they shower her with gifts, purses, shoes, food, phones, all the stuff this kid's never had. And one of the challenges we had working with her was to try and differentiate between the hell she grew up in and while having sex with some icky old guys, oh well, because look at all the stuff I have and, and nobody's beating me or throwing me out or trying to tune up everybody else in the house. She did not perceive that she was being trafficked. She had bonded with them because they treated her so much better, even though they were selling her for sex. And that is the upside down. Folks, listen, thank you so much. Thank you on Zoom. Thank you for being here. Let's, let's acknowledge this panel because they are fantastic. Again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for the Zoom participants. That concludes our event this evening.